All right, what's going on, everybody? This is John, and uh, we want to try something. We want to try something new uh, for for the learning season. So we are currently, as you as you guys know, in your small groups and as a church, going through the Book of Ephesians. And um, when we do small group discussion, you know, obviously the point of the small group time is to to have good discussion and to talk to each other about you know your own experience and your faith and your own understanding of faith, and then get other people's perspectives and. And it's really, really valuable to, to do that. But in terms of um, that platform, there's like a little bit of, of a limitation because if somebody were to go through the Bible, you know, line by line or topic by topic or section by section, uh, it could be informative and it could be interesting depending on if you like that kind of thing, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be great for discussion. And so what we wanted to try was to just do something that's a little bit more in depth and to go like deeper into the book of Ephesians and then put that out with the small group video and the curriculum so that everybody uh, who wants to, to dive deeper and who wants to think more about the, the letter and the theology of the letter can, can just watch this video and, and go through that. So then what's gonna happen is that by the end of the learning season, you're going to have gone through the entire book of Ephesians with a journal where you're like actively engaging with the text with a small group where you're discussing key themes and topics and, and how it applies to your life. And then you're, you're gonna have this video where you can think more in depth about the theology and the, the technical things that are going on in the text. And that, that's, a, that's a pretty good curriculum for, for a book of the Bible. It's, that's very similar to something that you would go through in seminary. So, so hopefully those three things, plus a Sunday morning identity series on the book of Ephesians, hopefully those four things um, come together to, to give you like a really rich three months in going through uh, a, a book of the Bible. And so, um, you know, I don't know if this is going to be interesting to you. My plan is just to go through this like line by line and read it and talk about it. And so, um, you know, g give it a try and, and, and see if, if you like it. So, so obviously we're going to start in, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. And um, if you were in your small groups the, the first week, you know that we went over a little bit of the, the, the story of Paul and who he was and what he was doing. Um, and some of his background, because that helps us understand kind of, you know, where the author is coming from. In order to understand what the author is trying to say, it's very helpful to understand the author's context. And so one of the key things to know about Paul is that he was a Pharisee. And, you know, what that means is that he was one of the, the synagogue or temple teachers. And so uh, no matter how well you know the Bible, because you love it and because you've been around church for a long time, you don't know it as well as Paul did. Okay, Paul was like an absolute expert in the Bible, just like anyone who had made it to his level of leadership in the Jewish faith. The, the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, were probably so internalized in Paul's mind and experience that that was his understanding of reality. So you think about Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and um, uh, the, the prophets and the history books of, of Joshua and First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, uh, and then all of the, the prophets who, who come, like that was all so internalized with Paul that it was the air that he breathed. And so Paul's not really coming at this stuff from like an abstract theology standpoint. He's coming at this from the understanding of the story of God, what God has been up to in the world and mo more specifically in the nation of Israel. So for Paul, Jesus and the Christ event and now following Jesus is not necessarily a new religion in the sense of like, I used to be Jewish and now I'm Christian. Um, Jesus was the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. So, so the Jews were waiting for a, a, a king called the Messiah or, or what's in Greek, the Christ, to come and save them to free them from, from the Romans, to free them from oppression and bondage, to bring them back into the land and to somehow rectify their relationship with God. And so according you know, what Paul believed and what the followers of Christ believe is that that is Christ, right? Christ is Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And he is the fulfillment of the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, the fulfillment of the promises of God to Israel. Um, and so everything that Paul says is, is within that context. 
Um, nothing is really uh, just made up. It all has to do with how the story and promises of God has been fulfilled through Jesus on his uh, life, death, resurrection, and ascension um, to, to God. So everything that he says is within the storyline of Christ and, or the storyline of God and, and humans and Israel and what God is up to in this world. So Paul founded the, the church of, of Ephesus, and you can read about this in the book of Acts. And he was there for like years. So he really created a foundation with this community of people. So one of the reasons that's important is because what you see in the first chapter is like a high-level summary of the gospel. But there's not a lot of detail. There's not a lot of like technical understanding. And one of the reasons why that probably the case is because Paul had already evangelized this church. You know, he's writing to the church. He's not writing to non-believers. He's writing to the church that he founded. So he was there for, for years. And in those years, he probably went through more detail than we could possibly imagine with the leaders of that church and the people in those communities. And so what he's doing in chapter one is he's kind of high level, like reminding them about the truths of God, not necessarily uh, the way that you would approach somebody who doesn't know Jesus yet. Uh, and so, so I think that that's, that, that's helpful. Um, so, so what I want to do is just start at the beginning and start to read through it and talk about some themes and uh, talk about, you know, um, maybe some, some deeper understanding of, of what Paul is talking about in this book. And so I'm reading out of the ESV, uh, but, but feel free to, to use any translation that is comfortable for you. And we'll, we'll start chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God. So that word apostle is a Greek word apostolos, which, which means sent one. And so what Paul believed about himself and the other leaders of the church is that you know, they're sent from God to spread the gospel, the Great Commission, go and, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, um, be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? We, we as Christians are, are sent into the world. So an apostle of, of Christ is a sent one of Jesus by the will of God. So Paul goes into uh, Ephesus or went into Ephesus and preached the gospel. And now there's a church there. Um, the other interesting thing in, in that is to the saints of, uh, who are in Ephesus. And so that word saints um, is probably better translated as holy ones. It's a Greek word, agios, and that means holy. And so it's the noun for holy. So it's like the holy ones. And the reason this is important is because what I explained about Paul's Jewish context. You know, he, he's uh, uh, the nation of, of Israel. The Jews were the chosen people of God, the holy, set-apart, unique people of God. And so part of what this letter is about is how now anyone who puts their faith in Christ is adopted into that family, is made a holy one, is made a saint. And, and saint is just a translation of holy one. And so anybody who hears the gospel, anyone who believes and puts their faith in Christ and starts to live that out and, 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 and pursues their relationship with Christ is now a holy one of God in the same way that Israel was, was the holy people of God that God had chosen to, to be his people. And so we go on and it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Um, you know, one of the, the interesting things about Paul's theology is that when Paul talks about our relationship with Christ and what Christ has done, he uses the preposition in. 
So he says that we are in Christ. And I think in the first two chapters, he says in Christ like 13 or 14 times. And that's an interesting thing, in my opinion, because when we talk about God or Jesus and, and we use prepositions to describe what he's done, we usually use other ones, you know, like through Christ or by Christ or because of Christ. And Paul seems to base his entire theology on the idea of being in Christ. And we're in Christ. And what does that mean? And, and why is that important? And I think that one of the things that we often miss in our understanding of the world and our understanding of, of, of our relationship with God is that um, what Orthodox Christianity confesses and what Paul is talking about when he says in Christ is that we are actually united with Jesus. So what happened to Jesus is now happening to us. What is true of Jesus is true of us. And so like there's a union that happens with us and Jesus in terms of our existence, in terms of our reality. So it's not that, that Jesus has done something over there and now we enjoy the benefits of that. It's that Christ has done that. Our faith binds us to Christ. We are now incorporated into Christ. And what's true of Jesus is now true of us. And so you think about the practice of baptism, right? And what, what baptism is, is it's a symbolic representation of being in Christ, it's not a symbolic representation of just what Christ has done. It's a representation of what is true of us now that Christ has done that and we're in Christ. So let me explain. Uh, you get in the water and you go under the water because you are dying the death that Christ died right, on the cross. And then you're pulled out of the water because you are raising to new life like Christ rose out of the grave. And so what that symbolically represents in front of your community and your church is that what's true of Jesus is true of you. Um, you, have, you. Because you have put your faith in Christ, you've been united with Christ, incorporated into his reality, and so you've died his death to sin, and you've risen to resurrection life. And you are now living in an inaugurated kingdom as, as a child of God in Christ. So the reason that I think this is important is because it makes the gospel something that is, is, is an occurrence. It's something that has happened to you, right? Um, N.T. Wright says that the gospel is not good advice, it's good news. And news is something that's occurred. You know, you, you, um, if you were alive during World War II, you, you woke up and you read the newspaper, and in December... Uh, you read the newspaper and it said that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And that is an event that has occurred and now everything is different because of that event. And that is what is true of us and Jesus' death on the cross. It's something that has happened. And through faith, we're united with that reality. And that reality becomes our reality. We've died with Jesus. We've risen to new life with Jesus. It is true of us in terms of our being, in terms of who we are. And I think that it's important for us to understand that if we want to understand the rest of the things that Paul uh, talks about. Um, some of the other things to just touch on in, in that part is it, it does say that uh, we have been predestined for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And a lot of us, uh, we, we confuse the idea of predestination with election. And so election is the idea that we're chosen. And there are certain theologies that say that some people are chosen and some people aren't. So if you have come into a relationship with God, it's because you were chosen by God. Uh, and, and so like, I don't really want to get into the nuances of that and whether or not I believe that. But I do want to say that here, predestination is a different idea. What predestination is, is ultimately talking about is the way that God has gone about rectifying the world. So um, Genesis chapter 3, there's a, there's, a, there's a massive fracture in humanity and the world. And from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Christ on the cross is the story of how God chooses to fix that situation. And a lot of it is very surprising and unexpected and hard to believe. But the story of the Bible is the story of how humans were supposed to be this thing in Genesis 1 and 2. We have vacated that, that job of ruling the world on God's behalf. 
and God has chosen, rather than give up on us, to rectify that situation, to redeem us, to restore us back to what we were always supposed to be. And that's the story of Scripture, and that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So what Paul's talking about here in terms of you know, predestined to adoption is that you know, from the beginning of time, this is how God planned to do this. Now, we didn't always know that, and we're not really sure why he chose to go about it the way that he did. But what Paul is saying is that from the beginning of time, uh, God chose, the Father chose, that you would be adopted as a son or a daughter through the blood of Jesus Christ. That was predestined. That was something that was known. God would fulfill his promises through Christ, and you are now a, a, a part of that restored creation. And adoption is, is a really interesting thing to think about, because when we talk about how we have a relationship with God, I think a lot of times our understanding is very technical, and we talk about things like justification and righteousness, which is, which is really important to understand, that you know we're sinful, and we can't make ourselves not sinful. Um, we, have, we have incurred debt because of the way that we live in this world, right? We, we have taken God's good world, and at times, instead of making it better, we've, we've, we've unraveled it. You know, we've used the same power and intellect and abilities, and instead of doing what we're supposed to do, we did the opposite. And so, like, that's part of our nature. There's something about us that is not as it ought to be, and we can't change that. And so in order to fix that, Christ had to die a sacrificial, atoning death on the cross that forgives us of our sins, that imputes his righteousness onto us, and uh, pays the debt that we have incurred through our sin. Um, now, now, that's all true, but that's a very like impersonal understanding of the gospel. Right? We're missing something in that. And I think oftentimes what we miss is this familial aspect of, of being adopted by, by God into the family of God through Jesus Christ. Because adoption is this beautiful picture of a, a, a loving parent or, or two loving parents looking at a child who is not theirs and saying, that child is now mine. That's my child now. And that is the reality of, of our relationship with Christ, is that we are not merely tolerated. We are delighted in. God is not so mad at us that he wants to kill us, but he killed Jesus instead, so now it's fine. That's a very reductive understanding of the gospel. Actually, God delights in us. He, he insists on being with us. He insists on pursuing us. He chases us. And he grabs us through the blood of Christ and adopts us into his family to become what we were always supposed to become. We are that loved. We are that delighted in. And we are not merely tolerated. And it doesn't just have to do with guilt and innocence and debt and repayment. It has to do with being loved into redemption, adopted into the, the, the family of God, which is, which is really cool. He goes on to say that uh, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of grace. Um, down in chapter 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so um, this is kind of Paul's summary of what has happened to us because we're in Christ. We're redeemed and we're forgiven. We're made new. You know, the idea of redemption is the idea of slavery. Because if you think about what I talked about in terms of sin in our lives, like we're under the power of sin. You know, we, we worship things other than God. And it seems like we can't help ourselves. And so we're like enslaved by that. And so through the death of Christ and us being in Christ, we, uh, we actually uh, are, are changed. You know, we're actually freed from that bondage, from that sin. And so we're redeemed and we are forgiven. And uh, at the very end, there's this idea of uniting all things in him, things on heaven and, and things on earth. And the Greek word for, for that is a, a very uh, hard word to say. It's anakephaliositai. Anakephaliositai. And what that means, really, like literally, is to recapitulate or retell. 
And so you think about the story of, of the Bible that we've been talking about and the fact that, that fr- this, is, this is a culmination of what's happened from the very beginning. You know, we were created in the image of God and we were supposed to rule and reign in this world uh, on his behalf, in his name, in his character. And Genesis chapter 3 is the fall where instead of ruling the world on God's behalf, we start to rule the world on our own behalf. And so this is a betrayal. This is doing the exact opposite of what we were created to do. Because when we give our powers to things other than God, um, the world unravels. You know, that's what the flood story is about. It's a decreation story. The evil of humans has the ability to take God's good world and because of this sin, totally unravel it. And all you have to do is look at certain relationships in your own life and relationships in the lives of other people and you see that we have an immense ability to do the opposite of what we were created to do. We have a really uh, good ability to take this world and make it worse instead of better uh, because of the, the, the sin in our life. And so the story of the Bible is how God goes about retelling that story, recapitulating that story, or what it says here, to unite all things in Christ. Because what Paul is saying is that the way that that story has been retold is that Christ has come and lived as the proper human, as the proper image, and now we're in Christ. So we are, that is now true of us. So even though there's still sin in our life, even though we are still subject to these powers, and and even though we still continue to fall short, we are united with Jesus in Christ, and so the story is being retold the way that that, that it was always supposed to be. We have gone back to Genesis chapter 1 and are now in a phase of our life where we're moving towards being the proper images, transforming into the likeness of Christ, um, recapitulating the, the whole story. Um, so we, 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 we go on. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And so here's some of the theology of the Holy Spirit because this is kind of a complicated idea. Um, the, the Holy Spirit is something that Jesus promised to his disciples uh, specifically in, in the book of John and that we see come to fruition in the book of Acts when, at, at Pentecost. You know, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And uh, what the, the people in Acts, the missionaries say as they go about their journeys is that when people are baptized, they can feel the Holy Spirit come upon them. Um, and so what is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is a third person of the Trinity. So it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's three distinct persons in the one Godhead. And so they're, they're, they're all equal and unique and unified. So it's kind of a a, a hard concept. There's diversity within unity. And the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And so what we believe as Christians is that when you put your faith in Christ and you become united with him, one of the things that happens is that the Spirit of God comes to live within us. And um, this is part of the way that we become transformed the way that we start to change, the way that, that it isn't just something we say we believe, it's something that starts to happen to us. We are, we are indwelt by the Spirit. We're inhabited by the Spirit of God. And what Paul says is that it's the guarantee of our inheritance. It's like the down payment. Because the moments in your life as a Christian, when you start to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which isn't constant because, like I said, we're still subject to sin and evil and darkness. But when you actually exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, um, that is heaven. Okay? So, so, so that is actually the first fruits of heaven. And when you think about the concept of first fruits, th- that's the idea of like the harvest is coming in. And the first fruits are when the harvest first starts to happen. So you go out into the field and you, you pick your wheat and it's the first wheat to, to grow. And you pick it up and you see it and that's the first fruit. Now that's not the whole harvest, right? There's a whole another harvest coming. So that might take another couple months or whatever. 
But that first fruit is the actual thing itself. It's only partial, but it's the actual thing. And so your relationship with the Spirit of God, your uh, indwelt nature of who you are as a Christian, and the way that that fruit starts to bear in your life, that is the real thing. That's the real deal. That's not just an imitation. Uh, it's not complete. You know, we're not, we're not totally restored yet. But in those moments, it's like the veil between heaven and earth has become so thin that you can see right through it, that you can put your hand through it and that you can touch it. That's, that's the first fruit, you know. Um, one of the greatest, I think, tragedies of modern Christianity is that because of our understanding of the material world, we don't really believe in spirits. You know, we don't really believe in, in, in um, that realm. And so the idea of the Holy Spirit is kind of like foreign to us. Like we don't really know what to do with that. And so most of us walk around not knowing or not recognizing that we are temples where the Spirit of God dwells in our day-to-day -day life. Everywhere we go, right? That's the job of the church. How do people know who Jesus is? How do people know who God is? Well, through Christians, through us. They look at us and we, in us, dwells the Holy Spirit, dwells God himself, and so people can see God through us. Now, we are not God, but what Paul says is that we're temples. Your body is a temple. And that means that that's where God dwells. Because when you think about the nation of Israel, they believe that, that God's spirit dwelt in the holy of holies in the temple. And so you're the temple now. The spirit of God dwells in you. And that should animate the way that, that we walk around. You know, the first fruit of heaven can manifest itself here on earth through us in our lives and in the way that we love and in the way that we treat people and in the way that we care for the environment and the way that we move in this world as temples of the, the living God, which I think is, is a pretty amazing thing to, uh, to, to be able to, to say. And so we'll go on to the next section, uh, starting in verse 15. For this reason, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so um, one of the things that, that I think is, is really interesting about this chapter, this, this piece right there, so all of that that I just read, is that Paul is kind of talking about the amazing things that are true now that we're in Christ, right? These things that's really hard to fathom because it's just so beautiful and different than what we may feel about ourselves. Um, you know, it says that, that uh, the riches of his glorious inheritance and the saints, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards you, the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, which is where you are, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and over every name that is named, um, the fullness of God who, who dwells all in all. Like these are the promises of the gospel. And it's foundational in our understanding, but, but those things are so great and so amazing that like, do we really believe it? You know, we went through as a staff um, in the morning the other day, the first chapter of, of Ephesians. And we talked about like what, what stands out to you. And everybody on our staff looked at the promises of God that Paul's talking about here. And they said, it, feels, it, it doesn't feel like that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, like I, I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm in Christ. I know I have the spirit of God in me. But these promises, this inheritance, this reality doesn't really seem real. You know, most of the time I walk around and I just kind of feel normal. I feel like I did before. I feel like I did before I was saved. I just feel like a normal person. 
Um, I don't feel like the power of God is animating me and that these, these truths are all true of me. And the reason I think that's so interesting is because look at what Paul does here. He says, uh, um, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So what Paul is praying here and what he's telling the Ephesians that he prays for them is that they can recognize the reality of the gospel. So he's not praying that this becomes true for them. It is true of them. They are in Christ. They are indwelt by the Spirit. The reality of the gospel is true. It has taken hold in your life as a believer, but it's hard to see. It's really hard to see, and it's hard to feel. And so Christ or, or Paul is praying the same thing that I pray for myself and for the staff and for the church, which is that the reality of the gospel becomes alive in us because it's true. So I pray that we recognize it, that we can have the eyes to see and the heart to feel that this truth is actually real because it's so difficult for us to believe that we're seated in the heavenly realms. It's so difficult for us to believe that the Spirit of God dwells within us, and yet it is true. When you've put your faith in Christ, and you give your allegiance to him, that is what happens. That is your reality. It's good news. It has occurred. Um, and so what we pray is that we can have the eyes to see it, the ears to hear it, and the heart to feel it, which is exactly what Paul prays for the church that he planted. Um, and so, you know, A, we can take comfort knowing that it's not, there's not something wrong with us in our inability to feel that sometimes. That seems to have been the case from the very beginning. Um, and yet, it is part of the Christian walk to become more and more aware of that. And, and, so, and so we pray, and we pray that those things become true for us, and we pray that those things become real. Uh, starting in chapter two, and we'll go through chapter two, and, and we'll be done. Um, it says, and you were dead in your trespass and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, you know, this is, this is maybe the most famous part of this letter, you know, Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, because it's one of the most succinct summarizations of being saved by grace through faith, which is a fundamental tenet of our faith. Uh, we are saved and have a relationship with God and have been rescued from the powers of sin and evil and darkness and have been given the spirit and have been lifted into the heavenly realms, not because of something that we have done, but because of something God has done for us. It's a gift. The Greek word is charis, grace, gift. It is definitionally undeserved. If you do something to earn it, it's not a gift, it's a reward. There's a word in Greek for reward and that's not what is used here, it's a gift. We have been given the gift of salvation through the blood of Christ. Um, Outside of this, we're separated from God. You know, we're by nature children who, who are deserving of wrath. And um, we sometimes don't like that language, but you do have to understand it in the context of the story. You know, the sin that we have in our lives, it's not just us breaking the rules or failing to follow the stipulations of God. Sin is tragic because it is us undoing the goodness of God's world. You know, we are fundamentally responsible for God's creation. That's what Genesis chapter one says. We were put in charge. And when we give our allegiance to other things, we, we undo it. We, instead of order and beauty and goodness, we bring 
disorder and chaos and evil and violence and death. And those things are not inconsequential. The price of, of, those, of those things, of undoing God's creation, man, like how can you calculate it? How, how could you even calculate what it means when we like destroy another person with gossip? When we make people feel like they're not valuable because of the way we treat them. When we hurt the environment because of our own comfort. When we use people as a means to an end. You know, these are not like inconsequential, oops, I did something wrong, mistakes. These are things that are consequential in taking the world where it's supposed to be taken. And so when it says that we're by nature deserving of wrath, it's like, yeah, because instead of being what we're supposed to be and taking the world where we ought to take it, we actually do the opposite. It's not even like we're just not good at taking it there. It's that instead of taking it there, we take it here. We destroy it, we unravel it, we unravel each other sometimes. And that is like, there is nothing more consequential than, than that. And so without the love of God, without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, without the forgiveness of our sins and the atonement for our sin, um, there is no hope. There is no hope for us. But the gift of God is that in Christ, on the cross, um, we have been made declared righteous We've been declared justified. We are, the debt has been paid. We have been washed clean. We have been adopted as sons and daughters. We've been taken and put into the heavenly realms in Christ. Uh, we have been united with Jesus. We have died his death. We have, we have raised to his life. And none of this is something that we could have done for ourselves. That's grace. That's charis. That is the gift of, of God. And it's really, really, really beautiful. Um, one of the things that's so interesting is that it says that God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive in Christ. So, like, think about that. We are actively participating against the will of God in our sin. And yet, even while we're doing that, because of his mercy and love, he, he grabbed us and he made us whole. He became flesh and blood. He died for us. That, that's the ultimate love story. You know, it, it's not just this technical aspect of like you're guilty, but now you're innocent. Now you're justified. You've been imputed with righteousness. Th those things are true. But it's much more a love story that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were dead in our transgressions, we were made alive in Christ, that is the love with which God has for you, and it's really, it's really hard to um, to articulate and, and to walk around and, and believe that. The last thing in this section I want to talk about is that it says, uh, "For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing; it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." That's interesting, right? Because we always read verses 8 and 9, and usually we don't read verse 10. And so verses 8 and 9 say that you're saved by grace, not by works. So you can't boast because you're not saved because of your works. But verse 10 says you were saved so that you could do good works. Okay, so this is interesting, right? This is where our faith starts to grow and the nuance of what Paul is talking about here. You know, it's like eating, eating solid food, going from milk to solid food, starting to understand the complexity of our salvation, you were saved so that you could be what you were supposed to be. What you were supposed to be is not just somebody who believes that God exists or believes that Jesus died on the cross for you. What you were supposed to be, what you were created to be is one who rules and reigns in this world on behalf of God, in his character, in his name. So you've been now united with Christ, in Christ, for what purpose? For your relationship to be rectified with God, but for you to be what you were always supposed to be. You know, the, the fundamental story of, of the cross is that you have been saved and cleansed and atoned for and made new. You've died and you've risen to life, and now you are to be what you were always created to be, a true image, just like Jesus. And so our faith is not a faith where we pray a prayer and like, that's it. 
Uh, I guess good works are like gravy on top of that. No, your faith is all about what you do. Now, you're not saved because of what you do. You're saved because of the grace of God, but you're saved for a purpose, right? You were created for a purpose. Now you're saved for a purpose. It's the same purpose to, to, to represent God in this world in the things that you do and the things that you say and the way that you love and the way that you are. You're a representation of God. You're an image of God and you were saved and restored so that you can act that out in real time, in real space, in the name of God, worshiping him, knowing how loved you are in relationship. And that, that's a beautiful thing. But there are too many Christians in our tradition who believe that the point is to say a prayer and then go to heaven when you die. It's not the point. It's never been the point in the Gospels. It's never been the point uh, in the story of the Bible. The story is that you have been restored for a purpose. And every one of us is responsible for picking up that purpose and, and doing it. The last thing uh, is, is this last section, so I'll read it, and, and I have one more thing I want to talk about, and then, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, starting in 2.11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. And through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So this idea of, of, of being one with Christ, Jews and Gentiles, right? Um, this is something that most of us don't have a firm grasp on because we don't know the story of the Bible. Right? Perhaps the most important piece, at least the piece that, that there's most of the writing is about, is, is about the nation of Israel. Right? So like, this is all about the nation of Israel. It's most of your Bible. And most of us are somewhat uncertain about the nation of Israel and what they were for and what all that means. And so we, we really have to understand that, that one of the greatest things that Paul was trying to communicate is how the people of God, Israel, and the people who are not the children of God, the Gentiles, are now, through Christ, both children of God. Very complicated, right? Um, the, the Abrahamic covenant is when God said to Abraham, um, go and, and, and I will uh, make a great nation out of you, and I will bless you, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and I will give you land, and I will give you a people, and through you, the whole world will be blessed. So there's like three promises, that there'll be a, a people made, that they'll have a land, and that the whole world through the nation of Israel will, will be blessed, will be restored back to what humanity was always supposed to be. So for all of Israel's history, they're the people of God, right? They're supposed to be the holy set apart people of God. They're supposed to represent God in the way that they act and in the way that they are. And that's like an ethnic tribal thing. And so what um, Christians believe happened through Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise, where the blessings have gone through the nation of Israel because Jesus was, was, was the king of the Jews, right? He was the Messiah. And now they're going through the nation of Israel out to the rest of the world. And so Paul's main theological point in this is that those who were far off, the Gentiles, and those who were near, the Jews, Israel, are now all one united family under Christ 
in Christ. And um, you have to understand that like, that's, that's a, that was a really hard thing to understand, right? We struggle uh, with multicultural movements um, today, and we think that we're really enlightened, right? We think that we're in a non-tribalistic period of, of humanity, and yet we struggle when there's a diverse, multi-ethnic, multinational movement, right? We don't, it, it's difficult. And so in the first century, when you were the nation of Israel under the oppression of Rome, like that is your identity, okay? So like you, that, that is your cultural heritage. And Rome wants you to assimilate into the culture and lose all of that, and you're doing everything you can to protect that. And then, the, the Christian church comes along and says, uh, there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male nor female. All is one under Christ. And so there is something threatening about that. You know, we have to, we have to be gracious to, to uh, people who, who belong to the nation of Israel where it's like, that, that seems dangerous. You know, and, and so there was, there was fights amongst uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians about what one had to do to come into the family of God. Do they still have to be circumcised? Because that was the mark of Israel. So that's the mark of the people of God. So you say that you believe in Christ, so now you're adopted into the family of God. Do you still have to go through circumcision? Do you have to follow the law? Do you have to follow the food laws? Do you have to follow the laws of worship and temple worship? Do you have to follow what is in the book of uh, the books of, of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the, um, the, the Torah? What, what do you have to do? And so Paul's main point here and what he wraps up here at the end of, of chapter 2 is that um, unexpectedly and surprisingly and miraculously, God has created a new people. And it's Jews and it's Gentiles and they're all equal and they're all one and there is no hierarchy. And because all are in Christ, all are in the heavenly realms. All are saved, all are forgiven, all are redeemed, all are freed. And the ethnic wall, the, the wall of hostility, the dividing wall that he talks about has been broken and gone away with the blood of Christ. Um, and we should appreciate how amazing and progressive the movement of Christianity was in, in the first century. For, for you to say, I'm gonna leave my tribe and my ethnicity and I'm going to leave my cultural markings and I'm going to become something new with these other people who are not my tribe, who are not my ethnicity. Man, that, that is a huge movement. And uh, one of the most earth-shattering, um, historically altering movements that has ever happened. Um, and that's what we get to be a part of according to the Apostle Paul. And so... Um, that's, ver or that's chapters one and two, and we'll come back next time and we will do chapters three and four. Again, just trying to do a little bit of a, of a deep dive into uh, the book of Ephesians to give you maybe as much depth as, as you want, as much um, detail as you want. And so hopefully you guys enjoyed that and, and I will see you next time.